Production funding for Behind the Headlines is made possible in part by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Shelby County District Attorney Steve Mulroy tonight on Behind the Headlines. Barnes at the Daily Memphian. Thanks for joining us. I am joined tonight by Steve Mulroy, District Attorney. Thanks for being here again. Pleasure. Along with Julia Baker, who covers criminal justice and public safety for us at the Daily Memphian. Thank you for being here again. Um, there's been so much focus on lately in the sort of public discussion, um, in comments we get, guest columns we get uh, around bail and when and why bail, is, how it's set when people are released, all those sort of interrelated issues. Sure. And if you bear with me, I'm going to give the kind of things I hear, the right. sort of layperson's um, uh, perspective on what's going on, and then sort of you both as DA and former you know, law professor and so on, sure. like fill in what is going on, because I think there's both a great deal of misinformation, mm. confusion, and frustration, right? Sure. I think your office has put out a number of statements about issues around this, trying to kind of help clarify. Right. A lot of misinformation. A lot of misinformation. So let me walk through just the basic scenario of bail and the purpose. I think most people get the sense that, you know, if um, uh, somebody is accused of, uh, I don't know what, you know, cheating on their taxes or something, they have no prior right. record, this person does not go to, need to rot in jail until they go to trial, right? Mm -hmm. They are maybe out on bail or they are out on their own recognizance, they have no prior record. Same maybe a disorderly conduct charge of somebody who's never they had too many drinks on Beale Street. They have no prior record. They didn't hurt anybody. They just embarrassed themselves. This person doesn't need to, um, it could be released on jail and in, or released on bail or something. Sure. Then you've got the extreme circumstances. People, um, sadly, you know, last fall we had a couple of incidents, you know, Ezekiel Kelly caught on tape, many witnesses killing people with a gun, prior record. Of course that person's not going to go out on jail and everyone gets, I think 99% right. people get, understand why. Right. The confusion comes with all these, these kind of middle <coughs> spaces. And I don't want to diminish the crimes, but, but auto break-ins, mm -hmm. carjackings, mm -hmm. and situations where um, people who have many prior offenses right. are arrested, they go to jail, and they are released in some you know, mm -hmm. 24 to 72 hours on a very small amount, a bail that maybe is set at 100,000, but really that is, they, they need to come up with 10% of that generally in way the bonding works, and they're out. And again, you know, Ezekiel Kelly was a repeat offender. He was, I don't know that he was out on bail, but he was a repeat offender. Uh, Cleo the Abstin, other who have been repeat offenders, people are so focused on that. For those middle space kind of offenses, and, and apologies for that phrasing, mm -hmm. And those are the ones that have people, many people, so scared right now and angry and frustrated. Right. They, they know someone or their car's been broken into, there was an attempted kidnapping, there was an attempted carjacking. What, why, people ask me and they ask in our comments, why would that person ever be released when they were arrested? Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, there's a lot there, so yeah, let, me, there let, there let me get to it. So first of all, quickly, the uh, killer of uh, Eliza Fletcher and uh, also separately Ezekiel Kelly weren't in fact released on bail. They had been, Correct. they served sentences and then released and then reoffended, yes. right? Yes. Which is its own issue because it shows how if we don't do anything to intervene with rehabilitation and we just put somebody in prison and they come back out, they're likely to reoffend, right? No one talks about that revolving door, but let's, let's talk about uh, bail. Um, so a couple of things we need to get clear just from the get go. First of all, the DA does not set bail. Right, the bail is set by judicial commissioners. In fact, in many of these high-profile cases, these middle ground cases you've talked about that were controversial, the DA's office either had no role whatsoever in the setting of the bail or the pretrial release or actively opposed what the judicial commissioners did. Uh, the other thing that I think people need to understand is that none of these recent controversial cases, your middle ground examples, have anything to do with the new bail system or bail reform, right? Because all of the new bail system did was to get in compliance with the law, which we had not been in compliance with, provided a hearing within 72 hours of arrest with counsel for the defendant if the person's still locked up after 72 hours. So these controversial middle ground cases had all been instances in which the judicial commissioner, you know, 
controversially, set a bail that allowed the person to get out before we even got to the new system. So that was a legacy of the old system, right? Um, but I think uh, maybe t to get to your point, many people, I think, seem to think that the amount of the bail is some sort of symbolic expression of how serious the underlying charge yeah. is, right? Yeah. Yes. That's not the way it's supposed to work under the law. The only reason that we set an unaffordable bail, the only reason that we would detain somebody prior to trial is if we think they're not going to show up for court again, they're going to skip town, or we think they're likely to reoffend and thus provide a uh, danger to the community. Because under the law, all of these people are presumed innocent until proven guilty. Now, what we don't really hear about as much now, but really should be uh, thinking about, is that under the prior system, we had a lot of the converse problems. We had far too many people languishing in jail without having been convicted of any crime for 18 months or longer. We were the leader in the state for that, for the simple reason that they couldn't afford cash bail. And many of those people were eventually released, right? But by then, the damage had been done. We disrupted their lives and their communities. A lot of, some of them were innocent. The longer you were there, the more likely you were to be black. So we, we have to guard against keeping innocent people locked up uh, as well as making sure that we keep people locked up who are likely to reoffend and who are a danger to the community. So to answer your question, those middle ground cases, the defining feature about whether they're released pending trial or not, or whether they were released with conditions, daily reporting, ankle monitors, or whatever, it isn't about the seriousness of the underlying charge because they haven't been convicted yet. It should be based on, based on this person's record and ties to the community, do we think he's likely to reoffend? If so, let's lock him up to keep the community safe. Let, and apologies to Julia. One more follow-up, and then we'll get yeah. hear, hear her in on these, this whole question. This is very right. helpful. Your, specific to your office, you talked about the role of the judicial commissioners. Yes. You talked about the role of the judges, because bail is sometimes set by a judge as well. Yes, yes sometimes. Okay. Mm -hmm. What is your authority to... Um, invoke whatever, whatever you know, pre-trial pre um, um, detention. I yes. mean, it, you, you, and I'm saying you, it's really your office and yeah. the folks who work for you. Yeah. I mean, they are in before the judicial commissioner saying, do not let this person out. They are dangerous, repeat offenses. And, but it's really just making the argument to yeah. that judicial commissioner. There's no authority you have to say, yeah, this one we're keeping. That's correct. We have no authority. We only have the authority to make recommendations to the judges. And I want to emphasize again that a lot of these controversial decisions were made uh, at the initial hearing uh, by the judicial commissioner before our office gets to it. We don't get involved until that 72-hour hearing. Until then, we're not involved. The judicial commissioner makes the decision. Okay. So, again, apologies to Julian, then I'm going to shut up. So for that, that first part, yeah. who is in that room in general? The judicial commissioner. And, Pre the, and the accused. And the accused, and that's it. Maybe their lawyer? No. No, they usually don't have a lawyer at that point. So, you know, this could happen. Like, these judicial commissioners work 24-7. Someone's arrested at 2 a.m. They're brought into the sally port at uh, the, the jail. Um, you know, there's a judicial commissioner on call. And a pretrial services, which is a, a county agency, will do an interview. They will, you know, provide basic information about the person's background. They'll provide this to the judicial commissioner, and the judicial commissioner will make an initial decision about setting, you know, bail. Okay. Um, if the person's able to make that bail right away, then we never touch the case. I mean, I'm later on for trial. But if they're still uh, in jail three days later, within 72 hours, then there's an actual hearing. They've gotten themselves a lawyer appointed. One of my prosecutors is down in there, and there's an argument. Should we allow this person to be out pending trial, or do we keep him? Okay. Julie. Um, one of those you know, middle ground cases that um, we were referring to is Chase Harris, mm -hmm. who um, is accused of shooting at an off-duty officer at Huey's mm -hmm. back in April. Mm -hmm. Since then, he's been out on bail, and I think before then, too, he's been out on bail and rearrested um, over and over again for prior um, alleged crimes. A couple of times. I mean, yeah, the media has reported times. it as like four or five times, and that's that's not really the case. But yeah, go ahead. Right. Yeah, mm -hmm. just under a handful of times. Um, but he never got to that 72-hour point where he got that bail hearing. Correct. Um, is there something that could have been differently to keep him detained and keep him from you know getting bail and then getting rearrested several times? Right. So on the Chase Harris thing, again, there's some mis misinformation about that because there was some email newsletter that was sent out that was incorrect. Um, 
from the mayor, from the, the mayor of Memphis. Yes, yes, and we eventually uh, corrected it, although there were still some inaccuracies in the correction. But in any event, um, within a week of him being arrested for the Huey shooting, we filed a motion to revoke uh, the bond. And then within a week after that, we went ahead and filed an indictment. And at the indictment stage, we can make a recommendation for bond that is more likely to be accepted uh, by the judge. And so as a result of those actions, Chase Harris got back into custody and he remains in custody, right, thanks to what we did. Now, you're asking, well, is there something that could have been done at that earlier stage? Yes, I think in that particular instance, that's an example where I think the judicial commissioner based on the prior arrests, probably should have set an unaffordable bail, right? And so we disagree with the decision that was made by the judicial commissioner in that case. And there are a handful of high profile cases where our office did disagree with the judicial commissioner. So I would, I would uh, advocate for the judicial commissioners being a little bit more willing to lean into unaffordable bail, i.e. pretrial detention, in cases where there's a long repeat history of crime. But Lest my comments be read as dumping on the judicial commissioners, who I think by and large do a good job, I want to say, although there are some high-profile cases where we disagree, disagree with what they did, I consider those to be the exceptions, not the rule. Most of the time, I think they act uh, appropriately. And, and I will also say this. We're spending a lot of time talking about bail, and I understand it because there's a lot of people talking about it, but I wonder whether we're focusing on it maybe more than it deserves for this reason. The vast majority of people who are let out on bail do not, in fact, reoffend, right? Uh, less than, t about 20% or so do. Only less than 4% reoffend violently. And then if you were to take all those cases of people reoffending before their case was disposed of, while they're on bail, and you add them all up, it's still less than one-eighth of the total amount of crimes that occur every year. Is that, is that some hundreds of people or some thousands of people? That when you boil it down that way, which is, I think, really yes, useful. Yes, yes. Um, well, you know, we're talking about over 100,000 uh, cases uh, every year in Shelby County. Yeah. So um, the number of reoffenses is probably in the hundreds or it may, it may be go over 1,000. But, but I think that the, the point is, since it's such a small fraction of the total number of crimes, even if we were to shut down bail entirely and just say, throw the Constitution out, we would still have an unacceptably high crime rate. But I guess what I'm trying to say is, bail is a little bit of a problem. There is room for improvement. It's this much of the problem, and it's getting this much attention. For that small percentage of people who do reoffend, is there any chance at rehabilitation for them? Yes, I think there is. I mean, obviously it depends on the facts. Some of those people who've reoffended, if they're just a serial reoffender and all rehabilitative efforts have tried and failed, you know, there is a small percentage of those that I guess maybe we need to give up on and just talk about long-term incarceration. But I think for a lot of them, uh, there is a chance for rehabilitation, and, and that illustrates how little we try with rehabilitation. You know, I mean, we, we, put, we block people up. We don't really do much with them. They eventually get out, and they return to the only life they've ever known, and we act surprised when that happens. Like I said before, that's part of the revolving door that we don't really focus on as much as we should, we really need to be focusing on intervening with these people um, to try to get them, you know, if it's substance abuse problems, is it an employment issue, is it an education issue, what is it, so that they have some realistic alternative to life on the street. That not only is more humane for them, but more important for our purposes, it's more likely to reduce that repeat offender rate and thus make us safer in the long run. For, for that small number of people, and you're not the only one who said that, and, and that, they, that it, when you really boil it down, it is this small number of people, which, I mean, on some part of me and I think others think, well, that makes the problem actually a little bit more manageable, mm -hmm. that if we can focus on that relatively small number of people who are doing some of these, these repeat offenses mm -hmm. and these most disruptive of things, um, that, that we'll get to the, the arrests that you and the others, uh, yes. the, the various law enforcement agencies made of people who, a group that have been breaking into liquor stores, very yes. high profile, what, some 21 yes. break-ins. Yes. It's a small group of people yes. and you all, you got to them and we'll talk about that. Yeah. Back to this, to the notion of rehabilitation, the notion of what do we do if we're not just going to lock everybody up, this small group up, for a long time? Right. Who, who takes care of that? You know, who takes that person and says, you're a repeat offender, you've broken into 10 cars, you've attempted carjacking, you have a, you know, you, a, 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 you, some kind of weapons offense, you know. What happens to that person beyond being released 
and having an ankle bracelet and a summons to appear in court X months down the road. Well, and who's who? Yeah. Like who intercedes at that point? Yeah, so I think we should really be focusing not, not just on the period between arrest and ultimate disposition, but just in general, what happens to these people. And uh, it's a good question because the responsibility is diffused, yeah. right? The court has a certain amount of responsibility, maybe their counsel, public defender. If they go to prison, Tennessee Department of Corrections theoretically has a responsibility, but I don't think they do all that much with re rehabilitation. And, Maybe it's a resources issue. I'm not throwing shade on the TDOC officials. Um, I think in the past, the view was that the DA's office, that wasn't really their job. Their job was to lock people up. But I take a different view. I think it's very much our job. And I am trying to get my prosecutors to be focusing more and more on not just how long can we lock the person up, but what interventions can we require as part of the plea deal. You know, you must get your GED, you must get a job, you must get substance abuse treatment, you must do anger management, as much of that as possible, because I think that's more likely to actually reduce that repeat offender rate and make us longer uh, term safe. Uh, we got 10 minutes left, and I should also note to people that we're taping this on Wednesday morning, so uh, just so we know there's a bit of a delay before this is aired uh, because of my schedule. So, uh, Julia. Um, you know, what about, you know, juvenile transfer? Um, I know that you um, had a campaign promise of transferring fewer juveniles. Mm -hmm. um, there was a 15-year-old who um, allegedly shot and killed John Materna, who um, was also known as the Watermelon Man. Mm -hmm. He sold watermelon um, in um, uh, the Nutbush area. Right. Um, you know, ha I think he had, you know, some prior charges as he well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, how, how does someone like that get to that point? Well, I mean, that is a great uh, question. You know, um, one of the things that Judge Sugarman, the newly elected juvenile court judge, and I have been talking about doing is trying to intervene earlier in the process in the what we call the dependency and neglect docket. So before they ever get into the delinquency docket, a lot of these kids are, are you know, in the, what we call the D&C docket because you know, the parents aren't taking good care of them. They've got other kinds of problems at home. Maybe we need foster care. Maybe we need some sort of group home intervention. And, you know, as sure as night follows day, a large chunk of those kids on the DNC docket will end up in the delinquency docket. And then a certain percentage of those are going to end up transferred to adult court. It's a pipeline. And we need to intervene uh, sooner than you know, sooner to try to uh, prevent that from happening. And so we're working with Judge Sugarman uh, on that. Um, my policy on transfer is that there are some situations like the watermelon man killing. You have a first degree murder. The person's got a record. Uh, transfer does seem appropriate, but it should be done as a last resort, not as a first instinct. And that is by law sometimes when there is a, you know, a murder case. By law, you have to file a motion to transfer that juvenile? No, no. no. Uh, the law says that uh, for certain offenses at certain ages, transfer is elig you're eligible for transfer but it's still up to the prosecutor to file the petition for transfer and it's still up to the juvenile court judge to accept that petition. And we are gonna talk about Operation Broken Bottles at some point, right? Yeah, 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 we yeah. certainly are. Okay. Uh, let's, let's go and go there because I think yeah. it, it is an example, I mean, correct yeah. me if I'm wrong, of this small group of people yes. and try, who are having a big impact and uh, in this case, a lot of high profile. So yes. Operation Broken Bottles is was what? Yeah, so um, Operation Broken Bottles was a, a, a program that the Memphis Police Department did uh, and partnership with the multi-agency gang unit, which had representatives of a number of different law enforcement agencies, but MPD took lead on this. And we all heard about this, you know, repeat smash and grab, break in retail, you know, 21 different stores uh, were violated, you know, over a period of time. It was an organized retail theft ring. It was a, a mob of people who did this over and over again in an organized fashion. Um, and uh, the multi-gang unit, set up a task force on it and then our office set up its own task force where we had a couple of prosecutors all those cases kept going to the same prosecutors rather than going to the different courts so that they could look for repeat players and patterns and work closely in partnership with the multi-gang a multi-agency gang unit to target these repeat offenders and it uh, bore fruit um 21 uh 25 people have been uh, uh, you know, identified. We've recently got indictments against 15 of them. Um, we're talking about you know, damage well in excess of a quarter million dollars, um, you know, dozens and dozens of car thefts and break-ins and gun thefts, some of them leading to violence. 
um, you know, 87 different counts, ranging to over 15 indictments. It's an example not only of what you just said about focusing on the repeat players who have an outside influence on what we call crime drivers, but it's also an example of what I'm trying to emphasize is partnerships between my office and law enforcement. We did a cold case unit that's um, solved four cases so far, some leading back as far as 1995. That's a partnership with MPD. Operation Broken Bottles is another example yeah. of that partnership. So uh, about how many of them have been, uh, with Operation Broken Bottles, mm -hmm. how many people have been arrested and booked? Of the 15 that have been indicted, um, all but two are in custody. There are two still at large, but we expect them to be in custody pretty quickly. You know what my question is going to be. Mm -hmm. Are they going to be released yeah. <clears throat> on bail? So this was one of those examples where we did a not in custody and indictment, and under that procedure, we get to make recommendations as to bond amounts that very often are accepted uh, by the court, and all of the bond amounts are very, very high. Um, one is as high as uh, half a million dollars. Many of them are well over $100,000. Given their records, I think those bond amounts are appropriate. The idea of pretrial detention is appropriate. I don't expect any of them to bond out. Okay. Um, you know, working with MPD, um, do you know how did in, you know the Memphis Police Department find these individuals? How did they know who, know who was involved and when? So I don't want to go into too much detail about investigative uh, methods because. Oh come on. <laughs> <laughs> well, the investigation is still ongoing. You know, as we said at the press conference uh, the other day. Uh, we expect more indictments to come. I mean, many more indictments to come. And there are still people out there that we're you know, going to try to target with this operation. Um, but um, you know, uh, there's different f f uh, forms of surveillance. Uh, there's, there's video. Um, you, know, you find cars, and you can track the cars to uh, individuals. Um, you know, once you start uh, getting a few people, then you can check their associates to see what you know, others are. So I don't want to go into too much detail. But um, it was, I think, a real case of um, one of my uh, prosecutors, Forrest Edwards in particular, working very, very closely with uh, the MGU, the multi-agency gang unit, and working collaboratively to follow up on these investigative leads. Um, <clears throat> the other, uh, other efforts like that? I mean, are under, I mean like some of the, the things right now that are um, really, you know, carjackings, auto thefts, auto break-ins, right. are there efforts like, without giving away too much, are there yeah. efforts, these kind of multi-agency efforts focused on those yes. as well? Yes, there are. There are some uh, multi-agency efforts focused on those. Okay. There's also, um, I'm talking with Judge Sugarman about a specialized docket for these um, car burglaries and uh, auto thefts. That involve juveniles? Yes, that yeah. involve juveniles, yes. Um, and then there are other initiatives like that. Coming back with just a couple of minutes left here to um, the judicial commissioners and the setting about one thing that changed in February, and you may have touched on this, but it's one that people, I have heard people get very fired up about, is mm -hmm. that in February with the changes to bail, mm -hmm. now a person's ability to pay or their income level would be a factor in setting bail. Mm -hmm. Critics have said, well, now people who go in who don't have any money, they're getting out, you know, because they can't pay and, and, and they're history, their repeat offenses, their who they are, all the other factors are being ignored. It's just about what they can pay. That is absolutely okay. not true. I mean, okay. we really need to clear this up. In fact, the statistics show that since the new bail hearing has been put in place, average bail amount for violent offenses has actually gone up significantly, while average bail amount for nonviolent offenses has gone down. And I think that's exactly what people expect. Right? So it's, it's actually the opposite of what um, I think the, the critics are saying out there. And just think about it right now. Do you want a situation in which two defendants commit the same crime with the same criminal history, one of them's making 150000 a year, one of them's making 20000 a year, they get the exact same bail, and then one of them bonds out and gets to live their life for the 18 months it takes for their uh, case to be disposed of, and the other languishes in 201 Poplar only because one is poor and one is not. That is not what the Constitution says. That is not what fairness says. And I don't think people want to think about that, really think that's a good idea. And that, again, that consideration does not somehow stand above the se severity of the act and so on. Of course not, no. Okay. And I think the criminal history is the key thing. If the person's a repeat offender, then we're more likely to think they're a danger to the community. We're likely to skip town. We're more likely to do pretrial detention. Yeah, and with apologies to Julia, with just two minutes left. The other thing, the focus on the judicial commissioners has been a very helpful conversation. I think Julia did some months ago. I mean, some people are saying, well, no one knows, even knows their names. I mean, we, yeah. their, their names are public, and you wrote an article about who these people are and so on. But is there enough transparency around 
the decision making and the, the considerations that the judicial commissioners and the, and the judges above them are making, just from your seat? Does the, does the public have a right to know more given there's such a focus? And maybe sure. would that not help diffuse some of the, the confusion and misinformation? I'm always in favor of more transparency. Um, so I mean, I'm not opposed to any of that. I think given the staggering amount of misinformation that's out there right now, then it probably uh, would help. I also say that, you know, Julie's done a good job not only about judicial commissioners, but also about judges in general and the trial docket and the backlog. And I think, you know, uh, it's appropriate that we shine a light on that. It, it can, part of what the light that Julia at work has shined is that not very many cases get heard or certainly finished every year. Is there more that needs to be done and more that your office can do to put either more pressure on the judges to go faster or at least to, even pulling together the information that Julie pulled together was an immense amount of work because there isn't really, there aren't good records around this. Well, that last point is about data, which I think is absolutely crucial. We don't have good data and I'm, uh, I've hired a new chief data officer, created the position okay. for the first time, and I'm in this partnership with this national group called Justice Innovation Labs, and we are working on getting our data better and that will help with what we call time to disposition. How can we get the cases resolved quicker? It's a big focus of our office. All right, we are out of time. Again, uh, thanks very much, Steve Mulroy. Thank you, Julia. Uh, again, we're taping on Wednesday morning. Uh, this, obviously, if you're watching it on, on Friday. Uh, next week, Mayor, Mayor of Germantown, Mike Palazzolo, along with Brent Taylor, state senator. And after that, a series of mayoral candidates, like we did Frank Colvett last week. We're trying to get to all of them before early voting in August. Thanks very much, and we'll see you next week. Thank you.